This program is brought to you by Emory University. I don't have a warm-up act. We're going to go very quickly into the proceedings this afternoon. As from uh, Judaism and Christianity, we turn to the youngest of the major Abrahamic faiths, Islam. Our speaker, Professor Sayed Hussain Nasser, emigrated to the United, State, United States in 1979 from Tehran, where he had received his early education. Among numerous academic appointments, Professor Nasser taught at Temple University from 1979 to 84, and since 1984, he's been the Professor of Islamic Studies at George Washington University. He's published extensively in English and Persian, and also in Arabic and French. He's the author of more than 50 books and 500 articles. Somewhat artificially, perhaps, um, one might divide his publications into three strands, although these overlap and are no doubt aspects of a single project. This is how it looks to me, uh, so you must forgive me, Professor Nasser, if you see them quite differently. First, Professor Nasser has written on Islamic philosophy during the formative period, corresponding to the European Middle Ages. Uh, for example, his introduction to Islamic cosmological doctrines, first published in 1964, is the standard work in its field and belongs on the bookshelf of every student of medieval philosophy and theology. Second, Professor Nasser is an exponent of the mystical dimension of Islam, especially in the Persian tradition and its influence on the arts, and his knowledge of this literature is unparalleled. Third, Professor Nasser writes confessionally and constructively as a Muslim, and in particular as an advocate for the idea of the perennial tradition and the transcendental unity of religions. If I may indulge in a small anecdote, in the late 1970s I was on a long train journey in England. At the beginning of the train journey I began a book by Professor Nasser. By the end of the journey I had finished the book and it, uh, it, I was doing something quite different. It made me decide to, to study religion and to turn to medieval theology. Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, I leave for others to decide. <laughs> in the paper that he will present for us today, Happiness and the Attainment of Happiness, an Islamic Perspective, uh, Professor Nasser will expound a distinctively Islamic take on what is arguably a universal theme. But in Islam, as indeed in patristic and medieval Christianity, happiness is an abiding paradisal condition transcending transient experience. After the talk, as usual, there'll be, uh, there'll be two responses, and I'll introduce the respondents in due course. Thank you, Professor Nasser. Rahim. Usually Muslims begin a discourse in the name of God and build the same, especially if you want to be happy. Uh, Professor Reynolds, Cornell, do well. It's a pleasure for me to come to this university again. I have lectured here before and I've also been in contact with and lectured with and discussed with His Holiness of Dalai Lama different matters for over four decades. So I'm very glad to have a small part to play in this very important uh, lecture, seminar, discussion that is taking place during these two days on the question of happiness. I don't know whether it's because we are too happy or not happy at all that no one talks about happiness anymore. The first time in human history, most art just puts happiness aside. Most of our buildings do not bring about happiness. Our cityscape, our city sprawl is not a place to be joyous in. But I'm glad that recently, even intellectually, there has been a revival of interest in, what, in the meaning of happiness itself, especially amidst the hedonistic society in which everything is supposed to do with happiness, but one which one pursues and never, never attains. Uh, since uh, this is to be a serious intellectual and scholarly discussion about happiness and the various traditions. I prepared a paper. I usually never read papers except when I give the gift for lecture or something like that, but I prepared a paper in honor of the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, really, uh, which deals uh, in depth with the Islamic understanding of happiness, this theme being so universal. Of course, in a period of 50 minutes when I'm going to speak to you, 
one cannot exhaust the subject. But in the published form that will come later, Professor Witt, I think, is publishing them. In the notes, there are many references, openings to other writings and other sources where people further interested in pursuing this subject will have a chance to do so. Let me begin with the Quranic verse, which has defined the very word for happiness in Islamic philosophy and theology for 1,400 years. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. يَوْمًا يَأْتِ لَا تَكَلَّمَ نَفْسٌ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ فَمِنْهُمْ شَقِيٌّ وَسَعِيدٌ in the new translation, which is coming out in the study of Quran, which I'm editing and I'm the chief editor next year will come out, inshallah, is as follows. On the day it comes, no soul shall speak save by his leave. Among them shall be the wretched and the felicitous or happy. And these two terms, wretched, shaqi in Arabic, and felicitous or happy Sa'id are key terms which have theologically and philosophically and to some extent, to a large extent also mystically in the Sufi tradition have been at the center of discussion of the meaning of happiness and its opposite in the Muslim mind, the wretchedness and happiness which has to do with shaqawa or shaqi. And when we come to the Sufi tradition, there's a very provocative, very beautiful poem in the Persian language by the great Khurasani poet of the 12th century, Farid al-Din Attar. He says, Sa'id az ma kudam asto shaqi kist. Who knows who in reality is reverent towards God? Among us, who is happy? Sa'id again. And who is wretched? Shaqi, that ultimately only God knows the state of our happiness in the final sense of the term happy. The experience of happiness is so universal that almost everyone from whatever culture he or she may be claims to recognize it when experiencing what to that person seems to be happiness. Although it may be much more difficult for him or her to articulate and define what it is. If one were to ask a per person from Japan or China, India or Burma, Persia or Egypt, France or America, or an aborigine from Australia, or a native from Mesoamerica, to complete the sentence, I'm happy because, the responses would fall into similar categories, dealing with such matters as health, wealth, sensual pleasure, power, satisfying human relations, and for some, prayer, performance of the good, beholding a beauty, attainment of salvific knowledge. The responses would depend on different human types and individual inclinations, but they would cut across geographic, historical, cultural, religious, and philosophical boundaries by which human collectivities are divided. And yet, what is considered to be real happiness, how it should be pursued, and how it can be attained are deeply affected by the Weltanschauung, the worldview of the cultures within which various human collectivities live. The case of Islam, which is at once religion, worldview, way of life, and culture is no exception. That is why even the question of the pursuit of happiness, which is the theme of this conference and so much emphasized in American culture, is envisaged differently in Islamic thought which is concerned above all with the attainment of enduring happiness, more so than in modern secularized and or hedonistic cultures. In Arabic, the term attainment of happiness, tahsil al-sa'ada, which is in fact the title of a famous work by the 10th century Islamic philosopher Abu Nasr al-Farabi, is used commonly while the very term pursuit of happiness is less commonly used and does not have the same resonance as does the widely used English term pursuit of happiness. The reason is that Islamic thought based on the Quran concerns itself above all with true happiness as a reality that is abiding and permanent and not only a transient experience. 
It also considered this permanent state that is in essence paradisal to be attainable and not only a goal to be pursued, for after all, it is possible to pursue something without ever attaining it. And so let us turn to the Quran, the source of all that is Islamic, and see how it deals with the question of happiness and themes and means to attain it. Perhaps the best way to approach this question is to turn to the cluster of Quranic terms that deal with what would be rendered in English as happiness, felicity, joy, rejoicing, contentment, pleasure, and the like. And I'm fully aware of the nuances of difference between these uh, cluster of words. These terms are interrelated in their meaning. But I said there are nuances of difference between them. Such as, for example, between the English term happiness and contentment, whereas in French, in fact, the two are the same. Je suis content means simply I'm happy. The most central term in the Quran is related to root S. Glaul Stabdi Sa'ada, from which comes the word Sa'ada, that is the closest translation in Arabic for the English term happiness or felicity. Words derived from this root appear twice in the Quran. And as for those who are felicitous, this is a verb form, they shall be in the garden, that is in paradise, abiding therein for so long as the heavens and the earth endure, save as the Lord wills a gift unfailing. And the verse already quoted at the beginning, which I will not repeat for you. Both of these verses relate happiness to the paradisal states and eschatological realities. And they're crystallized permanently in the Muslim mind, and uh, they have crystallized permanently in the Muslim mind, ultimate happiness with the spiritual world and the abiding states of paradise. And yet this Quranic usage does not limit this term sa'ad or happiness to only the other world. And words related to this root also going to be used in relation to man's life on earth. In fact, several words such as Sa'd, Sa'id, Mas'ud, Su'ad, Mas'udah, and many other words I will not repeat here, uh, are all related to the word Sa'ada, and they became popular, proper names for Muslim men and women throughout the Islamic world, in the same way that you have American and English women called joy, happy, or felicity. Another set of Quranic words related closely to the, in their field of meaning to happiness, felicity, gladness, and joy, derive from the root SRR, ser, such as yasurru, pleasing or gladdening to onlookers, surur, bestowing upon them radiance and joy, these are all Quranic quotations I'm making, masrur, and will make to his folk joyful, and so forth. Uh, the last two verses last, uh, again refer to eschatological and paradisical realities, but at the same time, they can refer to the joys in this world. And then they are derived from the root FRH, hard H, faraha, such as the noun farah and the verb yafrahu, yafrahu, which are usually rendered as rejoicing and rejoice. These terms are used in eight different Quranic verses and are most often connected with God's mercy, such as the bounty of God and is in his mercy in that let us rejoice and rejoicing in God's mercy themes very much also emphasized in the Bible. Like words derived from Sa'da, however, Farah and Surur are also used in Islam as proper names, and they're very popular. One of the most revealing clusters of cognate terms as far as the Quranic understanding of happiness is concerned is related to the root R-D-Y, Radia, that is usually translated as contentment. In one of the most famous verses of the Quran, it is stated, O thou soul, at peace, return unto thy Lord, content radiyatun, radiyatun, and contented mardiyatun. Enter among my servants, enter my garden, my paradise. Although here the word jannah that's used in the Quran, uh, this particular term is used, not that one, it must be remembered that the same name of one of the highest states of paradise according to the Quran, is Radwan, R-I-D-W-A-N, which comes from the same root, uh, and therefore uh, relates the highest spiritual state of man to
to happiness, to contentment. In this way, the Quran reaffirmed the relation of happiness and contentment with paradise. In the above quoted verse, it is emphasized that content means ultimately uh, to both for the soul to be content with God and in itself and for God to be content with the state of the soul. Conditions necessary to enter the garden. There was this reciprocity between God and the human being. But this ultimate state of spiritual happiness or contentment can also be situated in this life through spiritual practice. We can already live in the paradisal state in this world. It does not necessarily have to be at the physical death. Man or woman can already live in paradise inwardly while still being in this world. That is why the Sufis emphasize so much the state of content contentment and consider the spiritual station of rida or contentment to be one of the highest stations to be attained in the spiritual journey. Imam Abu Qasim al Qushayri, the famous 11th century Sufi master, goes so far as to call the state of contentment the highest spiritual station. Redwan, as God's good pleasure or contentment, is mentioned over 10 times in the Quran. And a Sufi such as Ibn Arabi states explicitly that the happy person is one with whom. God is pleased, is content. We cannot be happy unless God is happy with us. In this context, it is interesting to note that while for ordinary Muslims who have died, one says, Rahmatullah alayh, that's a common Arabic expression we use for the dead, that is, may, may God's mercy be upon him or her. For outstanding religious and spiritual figures, one says, Radiallahu anh, who or anha, may God be content with him or her. Or may God's contentment or Radwan be with him or her. It also means that he or she enters Radwan, that supreme paradise. One must also mention how popular are proper names, all based on this root, such as Rida, Murtada, Radiyadin, and so forth, in Arabic, again, for both men and women. Such usage brings into everyday Muslim life the significance of contentment and happiness as permanent spiritual stations, and not only transient psychological states. The opposite of the term farah in Arabic is sorrow or huzn. And in over 10 verses, the Quran refers to the spiritual character of happiness by negating from the saints or friends of God, awliya, its opposition or huz, that is, affirms happiness by negating sorrow from them. For example, in verse, a very famous verse, chapter 10, it states, Behold, truly the friends of God, no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. In this oft-repeated verse, the Quran emphasized the connection between the negation of the opposite of happiness, that is, grieving or sorrow, and the transcending of fear. The person who is content with God and with whom God is content fears nothing in this world. It, he is God's friend. And what fear can such a person have from anything since God is his or her friend? Finally, it must be emphasized that although the Quran relates real happiness to spiritual realities, it also mentions that man can ask God for happiness in this life as well as in the next. In a most celebrated verse that is often recited by Muslims in the on a daily basis, the Quran states, Our Lord, give us good in this world and good in the hereafter. Rabbana atana fi dunya hasana fi al-akharati hasana wa qana adab al-nar. And guide us from the fire. The word hasana here uh, is related to the word for hus, which we discussed yesterday with His Holiness. That means at once goodness, beauty, and virtue. With attainment is inseparable from the state of happiness. This and several other verses point to the unitary vision of Islam for what the life of this world is for believers, profoundly related to the life in the hereafter, in whose quality one can participate through the grace of revelation and religion, even in this world. The saints of the Prophet, a hadith, are in fact the first commentary upon the Quran, and both the technical terminology of the Quran and the meanings of its teachings are reflected in the vast collection of hadith the constraints of time and space do not allow us here to delve into the prophetic saints. But as an example, we quote only one hadith related to the theme of happiness, 
and contentment. The prophet said, God loveth those who are content. And many of his companions have mentioned that the prophet himself always had a happy countenance and smile. Abu Abdullah ibn Harith, one of the companions of the prophet, said that he had seen no one more given to smiling than God's messenger. Being the prophet and the universal per and perfect man par excellence for Muslims, he could not but reflect even in his daily life the permanent state of celestial happiness and contentment or rida. Now, as far as the Islamic wisdom tradition is concerned, we understand by this tradition in this context not only sapiental commentaries upon the Quran and Hadith, but also the Islamic spiritual intellectual disciplines, especially Sufism and Gnosis, Marfa, Irfan, philosophy, at both Hikmat and Falsafa, ethics, the cosmological sciences, and certain forms of philosophical theology. When we review the most notable works of this tradition, we see that the theme of happiness, Sa'ada, is amply treated in them, and that they elucidate and expand the Quranic teaching on the subject of happiness. The titles of many books belonging to this tradition are themselves revealing as far as the subject is concerned, for many of them use the term, the very term Sa'ada, happiness, even in their titles. One is only to recall the Tahsil al-Sa'ada of al-Farabi mentioned already. The Tartib al-Sa'ada, order of happiness, of Miskaway, another 10th, 11th century philosopher. The chapter of the Futuhat al makiya the Meccan illuminations of the 13th century Andalusian Sufi master and great Gnostic Ibn Arabi. And perhaps the most notable of all Islamic works bearing the word Sa'ada in his title, Al-Ghazali's Kimiyai Sa'adat, which is in Persian, the alchemy of happiness. It is of significance to note that this work, which is one of the masterpieces of Persian prose literature, is a summary written by Ghazali himself of his Ahya Ulum al-Din, the reification of the science of religion. That is perhaps the most influential work on ethics in Islamic history. The titles mentioned here are only meant to be examples and are far from being exhaustive. Moreover, there are numerous chapters and sections in the works of Islamic philosophers, Sufis, ethicists, and theologians dealing specifically with the theme of happiness. Needless to say, in this short presentation, it is not possible to deal with all the different issues related to this theme and treated by various authorities within this, this tradition. We can only do no more than to discuss here a few of the most salient and essential teachings of these masters. A full treatment of this very rich treasury of spiritual and intellectual teachings concerning happiness would require many volumes which one hopes one day will be written. Let us in any case begin, with not, uh, begin not with the most elevated metaphysical considerations but with the most immediate and practical realities with which Muslims are concerned in their everyday lives. That is faith, and the divine law, that is Iman and Sharia. The position of faith in God and his revelation is not only a peerless gift from him to his creatures, but also the source of happiness in the true sense of the term for those who have received this gift. This is of course a universal truth, emphasized not only in Islam, but in all other religions, especially Judaism and Christianity. The Quran, states, did we not expand for thee thy breast? The expansion and shirah of which the Quran speaks in this verse is directly related to the gift of faith and at the same time points to joy and happiness that is characteristic of this state of expansion. When we are happy, when we are happy, we experience psychologically an expansion in our being and consciousness. For even physical joy and happiness are reflected in our faces, a smile or laughter that expands our face. While we frown, our face contracts. In fact, one of the most commonly used words for happiness in Arabic is mafsut, meaning literally expanded. Faith in God is also inseparable from love of God. On the human plane, love is often combined with pain and sorrow. But the love of God is inseparable from joy and happiness even when there is longing and separation. To love God with all our being is to love all that one can love. And 
all that can be the source of ultimate happiness. This love re results in the attainment of all that is truly beautiful and that our soul seeks in the death of its being. For God is the infinite beauty and the source of all that is beautiful in the world around us and within us. How can a soul that attains through the love of God, attachment to the source of beauty, to all that attracts our immortal soul, not be in a state of joy and happiness? Moreover, love and faith are antidotes to what usually makes man unhappy, or women. Antidotes to doubt, anxiety, fear, and trepidation, provided human beings learn how to have complete confidence in God, tawakkul, and actually possess this virtue. The man who has this kind of confidence attains the state of contentment. He or she also faces the ordinary challenges of earthly life, but in a state of inner contentment. That is why the friends of God, the names of saints in Islam are called friends of God, who have attained fully the station of tawakkul and rida, that is, of contentment, of confidence and contentment, Fear not, nor are they ever sorrowful, as the Quran says explicitly. For such a person, even the fear of God is transformed into joy. For this fear is the beginning of wisdom, as stated by St. Paul, and also in the famous saying of the Prophet, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. As Al-Ghazali has stated, the difference between the creator and the creature is that when one is afraid of a creature, one runs away from it. But when one is afraid of God, one runs towards him. The Islamic saying, Tawakkaltu ala Allah, I take, I place my confidence in God, that is repeated so often in daily life throughout the Islamic world, results in taking refuge in the bosom of the divine, in a state of contentment that overcomes and transcends what causes sorrow and unhappiness in human life in this world. Of course, the acceptance of the gift of faith through the exercise of the freedom of the will that God has given us brings with this responsibility, which we must accept by virtue of having said yes to the question God posed to Adam and to all of us as his progeny, including those who came generations after him, even before the creation of the world. The Quran states that having created man God asked Adam and his progeny, am I not your Lord? And they said, yes, we bear witness. The acceptance of his lordship is the trust, amana, that we have all accepted to bear on that day beyond all days, the moments beyond all moments, that is called alast in Arabic, literally meaning am I not, the beginning of his Quranic verse. And with the acceptance of this tremendous trust comes tremendous responsibility a responsibility so great that according to the Quran, when it was offered to the heavens, the earth and the mountains, they refused to accept it. But man, that means the human state, human being, men and women, accepted it. As the divine poet of the Persian language, Hafiz says in a famous poem, heaven could not bear the weight of the trust. And so they cast a lot in the name of poor me. Whether we like it or not, we have accepted this trust. And the responsibilities that go with it, along with the danger of falling into the state of unhappiness, that is what defines our nature as human beings. That is why the fulfillment of these responsibilities brings with it ultimately joy and happiness, enabling us to be ourselves in the real sense, no matter how difficult fulfilling them might be and the refusal to accept these, these responsibilities leads almost inevitably to the state of wretchedness or unhappiness. These responsibilities include for all Muslims, first of all, to follow the divine law, al-sharia, which Muslims consider to be the concrete embodiment of God's will for human beings. Islam considers this true to apply a truth to apply not only in fact to Muslims, but to the followers of all religions, because the Quran teaches that God has sent his shara'a, that is plural of sharias, for different people and different religions that he has uh, revealed. Uh, just to correct this a statement that came out of the city a few weeks ago, which was horrendously wrong, 
the Muslims do not want to impose the Sharia upon anybody who's non-Muslim. The Ottoman world was the most powerful empire in the world for 700 years, and Islamic law was never imposed upon the Greek Orthodox. But after 500 years, it became the seat of the most deeply rooted spiritual interpretation of Christianity. After 500 years, the Muslim rule. So this absolute nonsense that goes around is simply has no historical truth. According to Islam, each uh, he, religious community is given its own Sharia. It's not the business of Muslims to impose the Sharia upon Christian, Jews, or for that matter, Hindus and Buddhists, which they did not do when they were in India. The Sharia in Islam is usually divided into matters of acts of worship, ibadat, and transactions, mu'amalat. To perform the obligatory acts of worship that includes the basic rites of canonical prayer, the five times a day prayer, the fasting of the month of Ramadan, pilgrimage once a li lifetime to Mecca, you should all do it before Ma Mecca is turned into downtown Manhattan. You, uh, Muslim, the audience should go as soon as you can. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> and the paying of religious tax all requires sacrifice and self-discipline, but they all result in joy and happiness for the person of faith who knows that in performing his rights, he or she is doing God's will. How can one not be happy in doing the will of the one whom we love and who loves us? Keeping the fast is not easy, but how much joy and happiness one observes during the month of Ramadan, the month of fasting, among those who do fast. The pilgrimage is difficult. It's a difficult rite, very difficult to perform. But when one is making this incambulation around the Kaaba, does one not see millions of joyous faces performing the same rite? It is not only the about that acts of worship, however, which bring about happiness in our knowing that in performing them, we're doing God's will and thereby experiencing the grace that issues from the performance of sacred rites. In carrying out ordinary human transactions or mu'amalat in accordance with the Sharia, the divine law, one is also doing God's will. To make a living in a manner that is legitimate, honest, halal, according to the injunction of the divine law, also brings with it an inner satisfaction that results in happiness no matter how difficult the chores of one's work might be. One can observe this truth in the degree of presence of happiness in those places in the Islamic world where the rhythm of life is based on traditional norms in comparison with what we observe in the hectic pace of life in modernized societies. One is only compare the number of smiling faces in a still traditional village, no matter how economically speaking poor, with the number of visibly happy people, unhappy, excuse me, visibly unhappy people riding on a subway in a big city. To surrender to the will of God and to live according to his will is such a source of joy and contentment that for the first time of faith, the faithful, it turns even the bitterness of death to sweetness. For such a person knows that in dying, he or she is surely doing God's will, for no soul leaves the body without his will, as the Quran makes clear in many passages. For the spiritual person, in fact, death is combined with ecstasy. On the basis of these universal considerations, Islamic wisdom, the Islamic wisdom tradition has sought to bring out the deeper meaning of happiness and contentment and what it means to attain happiness in a permanent and not only transient manner. Muslim sages have pointed out over and over that since God is a source of joy and contentment on the highest level, it is remembering him, dhikrullah, that this highest level of happiness is to be attained. Dhikr, as used by them, and especially by the Sufis, is not only mental remembrance of the concept of God, but actual repetition of his holy name in the form of incantory and quintessential prayer, with the goal of making this remembrance permanent in the soul, making the soul ultimately completely content and contented. Just to cite an example, Khaj Abdullah Ansari, the fifth century uh, Sufi patron of Harat, in present Afghanistan, says, there are three things upon which the happiness of the creature depends, and the face of servanthood is illuminated by it. The business of the tongue with the invoca invocation of the truth, which is the invocation of God, Dekr Haq, the drowning of the heart in the love of the truth, Mehra Haq and the filling of the secret of the heart by the gaze of the truth, Nazaraha. 
A person to whom God has given his own name to invoke possesses the most precious of all treasures, for ultimately God and his name are one, and therefore the name contains all that the soul could possibly desire in order to be ultimately happy. God is contented with the soul that remembers him, for he has created us and put us here on earth in order to be witness to him and to remember him at all times. When the Quran says that God has created man and jinn in order to worship him, it means that on the highest level to know him. And this knowledge is not possible without the Allah, with the invocation and remembrance of God, the prayer of the heart that is also the heart of all prayer. In the Islamic wisdom tradition, happiness is often associated with attainment of perfection, kamal. Of course, the human state opens unto the infinite, and the universal man or perfect man, which we all are potentially, but few realize in actuality, is the theater for the reflection, for the theophany, tajalli, of all of the divine names and qualities. And yet each human being has his or her own essence or archetype in God, and a perfection particular to him or her. Happiness for each person is inseparable from the realization of that particular perfection or kamal. And this principle applies in, in a sense to all beings, not only to human beings. The 13th century Sufi and philosopher after the Din Kashani writes in a treatise entitled significantly Madaraj al-Kamal, Degrees of Perfection. The happiness of each thing is in reaching the perfection that exists within itself. And its wretchedness is in not reaching and not being, uh, and being disconnected from that totality. This pithy statement is, a, in a sense, a summary commentary on what Al-Ghazali had written two centuries earlier. In the 16th chapter of his book, Alchemy of Happiness, enti uh, entitled The Happiness of Mankind is in the Knowledge of God, he writes, and uh, he had, uh, I've given a long, long quotation here which I do not have time to read for you here, but you can read it later. But what he really writes is that to each part of the human being, there is a particular pre pleasure. We have the pleasure of the eye to see beautiful forms, the pleasure of the ears to hear beautiful melodies, uh, the pleasure of the tongue is to taste uh, tasty food, uh, and not to go to fast food restaurants, of course. And, and, uh, it might be necessity, but not happiness. And builds from there step by step to psychological happiness, emotional happiness, and finally the ultimate happiness, which is the happiness with God uh, through our spirit. And I just, I just conclude by saying all the passion and pleasures and sensible objects that pertains to man's body are of necessity terminated at the moment of death. And the pains he has suffered come to naught. The pleasure of knowledge, however, that belongs to the heart doubles with death. For, of course, it means principial knowledge, not information on phone books. Uh, for the heart does not perish with death. Rather, it becomes more illuminated. And its pleasure doubles with the burden of other pa when the burden of other passions are lifted. We have cited this long passage because it describes clearly different kinds and degrees of happiness which Ghazali also associates in this text with pleasure, and the ha kinds of happiness that are open and possible for human beings. And the passage points to the essential difference between happiness that is transient and real happiness that is associated with permanence and that does not come to an end with the end of man's earthly life. This question of the transience of happiness and its permanence is absolutely essential to the understanding of the Islamic view of happiness. We're all, we can all be happy for a few moments. The tr trouble is the moments come to an end and become unhappy. And uh, artists should be always happy. So the question of duration is very, very important. It therefore associates happiness with paradisal realities echoing the major theme of the Quran concerning Sa'ada. Like other Muslim sages, Ghazali identifies happiness with knowledge of that which is abiding and at the highest level, the knowledge of God. This take, theme was taken up shortly after Al-Ghazali by Ibn Arabi, whose name I've already mentioned, the supreme master of Gnosis in Islam, especially in the Futurat al makiyah the Meccan revelations, which provides some of the most profound expositions of the subject. 
According to him, everything in this world is a reflection of some divine name. The reflections of names related to divine wrath lead to wretchedness, and those related to divine mercy to happiness or felicity. Authentic knowledge leads to salvation and deliverance, which is itself happiness and avoidance of wretchedness. It is in the nature of this kind of knowledge to lead man back to God through the path of happiness and felicity. And uh, many, uh, and any knowledge that does not do so is not authentic knowledge, but what Ibn Arabi calls opinion or surmise, done. Uh, Jaladin Rumi, our dear friend, as I say, was translated by a man living nearby here in Athens, Georgia, Coleman Barks, made famous, uh, although it's translation, I'm not from, originally from the Persian, but he must have, a, have had a gift for what Americans like in poetry, and that he has played a big role in popularizing Molana. The 13th century great Persian uh, Sufi poet who's buried in Turkey uh, has a wonderful poem. Uh, he says, Ziraki kamju yo heirani bekhar. Ziraki zan nasto heirani zafar. Seek cleverness less, but purchase wonder. For cleverness is but conjecture and wonder victory. Ibn Arabi also states that knowledge of God brings us closer to him and ultimate happiness is associated with his proximity to the divine. As ordinary happiness in this world is related to nearness to our object of desire. He writes, all felicity lies in knowledge of God and also the nearness which the Sufi defines as undertaking acts of obedience is a nearness to the servant's felicity through his being safe from wretchedness. The felicity of the servant lies in his attainment to all that his desires, all his desires without exception. And that takes place only in the garden, in paradise, not in this world. That is not a possibility in this world. As for this world, he must necessarily abandon those of his individual desires which detract from this felicity. The nearness of the common people and a people in general is nearest to felicity. The person obeys in order to gain felicity. Ibn Arabi insists that the knowledge that leads to felicity must be combined with practice, with living that knowledge and not knowing it only theoretically. And this practice in its most inward aspect is faith in God and what comes from him in accordance with the words of the messenger, not in accordance with only knowledge of it. Faith embraces all acts which are to be perfected, performed, or avoided. With only uh, the existence of the cosmos and all, and all things in it issues from pure being, which is the pure good. And felicity in itself uh, is related to that. Felicity, like goodness and beauty, permeates creation. And we are able to experience it whenever and wherever we behold the wonders of the world of nature not sullied by human hands. We experience this happiness in the majesty of the sunrise, in the flight of birds, in baby whales playing with their mothers as, as she sings, in the joy of lion cubs and kittens playing, in the blooming of flowers and the flow of a mountain stream. Everywhere virgin nature smiles at us, even its majestic and terrifying aspects, if they, are, if they also remind us of the majesty of God for joy and happiness are needed like leaven in the dough or the very substance of created things. If only we had eyes to see and ears to hear. As the Quran asserts, God did not create the world in vain, but in goodness and joy, and placed us in a natural environment that scintillates with happiness by virtue of its very existence that issues from his being, that is the source of all happiness. Ibn Arabi emphasizes this basic truth again and again and writes explicitly that God created the cosmos from non-existence, which is evil, only for the good, which is desired for it, and that is nothing but existence. Hence, the cosmos exists fundamentally for felicity, and it will reach its property at the end. He even goes further to state God created the cosmos only for the felicity in its essence. This assertion also implies that God has placed us in such a cosmos in order to be happy. He wants us to be happy if we submit ourselves to him and live according to, it, to the reality of our primordial nature, which we will still bear deep in our soul and fulfill the purpose for which we were created. 
This one thinks that this knowledge that leads to happiness is not bound to love. Ibn Arabi also emphasized the central role of love in the attainment of happiness. We love in everything that we love. The love of God that is made possible through revelation and the divine reports has a specific function leading to felicity. But even without revelation, love of God is a fact of existence. Though it cannot lead to our felicity unless we are aware of him whom we love. God reveals himself in every form, thus making it necessary that we love him in any form that we love. To be happy in this world, let's end the quotation from him, to be happy in this world is to realize that all love is ultimately the love of God, a truth that we can realize only if we gain that knowledge of the divine, which is possible only through faith in his revelation, a knowledge that is not possible to attain without divine love. The Islamic philosophers have also discussed uh, extensively uh, the question of happiness, including Ibn Sina, Sohravardi, and Mullah Sadr has related the whole question of happiness to his particular metaphysical uh, perspective of gradation of being and therefore gradation of happiness, which uh, uh, we all experience in life. There's only one happiness, but gradation of it. But I shall skip the uh, detailed discussion of the philosophers to turn to the last part of my discussion on my paper, the attainment of happiness. So we talk about happiness, but how do we attain it? To understand the meaning of happiness theoretically is one thing, and its attainment and realization another. Human beings, whether Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, or followers of the Navajo religions, know how to attain transient happiness, whether it be in the enjoyment of sensual pleasure or psychological satisfaction. Any hungry person is happy in eating a meal, or a person in prison or room getting fresh air outside, or a lover meeting his beloved. But these ordinary experiences of happiness are passing states, often followed by sadness. Yet the yearning of human beings for happiness, that does not cease. And that yearning itself leads to sadness if it is not satisfied. What is difficult to attain is permanent happiness in a world that some have characterized as the veil of tears. This was a Christian term. Islam, like other authentic religions, provides the means of attaining that permanent state of happiness by emphasizing the importance of not gaining freedom of the passions Passion itself, but freedom from the self. Not freedom of the self, but freedom from the self. Happiness is a celestial quality. The sparks of it shower upon us from the world of light, but the sparks are soon extinguished and turn into cinders in the world of darkness in which we live. But in fact, itself, this fact itself demonstrates that happiness issues from another world, from the spiritual world, beyond the confines of material existence. And the fact that we continue to yearn for happiness proves that in its essence our soul belongs to that paradisal world from which I descended here below. Again, as the cherubic poet Hafez says, I was an angel and the exalted paradise was my abode. It was Adam who brought me to this monastery of ruin. To attain permanent happiness, we must therefore remember who we are where we came from, where we are, why we are here, and where are we going. We must detach ourselves from fleeting pleasures and joys and seek permanent joy by attaching ourselves to the spiritual world, which is our spiritual original home, where alone we shall attain permanent happiness. We must die before we die, die to the world here and now in order to gain eternal felicity in the life of the spirit and the intellect understood in its original sense. We must experience the happiness that issues from faith, which provides for us security. In Arabic, faith and security, again, are, have roots similar to each other, iman and aman, from, which, uh, from all that would deprive us of happiness. On the highest level, we must experience the happiness of our own annihilation in God and subsistence in him, in the full realization of unity. Only through leading a spiritual life do we gain that peace that passes all understanding. The attainment that abides, abiding happiness for which we were brought into this world and which is our birthright. By virtue of our uh, happiness, uh, 
by virtue of our primordial nature that we must have forgotten and that we must recall. To be truly happy, we must rediscover who we really are. In this process of remembrance, even sadness can be a major step towards the attainment of happiness. If the sadness be the nostalgia for our original abode, which is proximity to God, it is in this sense that one must understand the famous Persian poem, my sadness for thee, addressing God, be glorified for it is an eternal sadness. I shall not give up the sadness for a thousand forms of joy. This is this spiritual nostalgia which itself is the source of very, very profound joy. Happiness is not only related to goodness, but also to beauty. As the famous hadith of the prophet said, God is beauty, beautiful, and he loves beauty. My time is unfortunately up, and I just want to very, very quickly conclude the last sentence. Uh, Islam recognizes the need of man for happiness and points men and women to that spiritual reality wherein alone permanent happiness is to be attained. It also provides through its moral and spiritual teaching the means to attain that happiness that does not cease. It teaches that through reverence towards God and reverential fear of him, what the Quran called taqwa, we must pull the roots of our soul out of its transient world and plant it in the divine reality from which it has come. We must transcend the stifling prison of the ego through faith, correct action and prayer and realized knowledge. We must break the walls of the ego and we must also do so through generosity, compassion and charity, through ithar and karam, which are bound to love and which are means of overcoming self-centeredness and selfishness that are such impediments to the attainment of real happiness. As all the sages, some of whom we have already cited, repeat, the highest happiness comes from knowledge of the truth and its realization in our being. Truth with a capital T, what Christ spoke about. We must seek with our whole be being this salvific knowledge that transforms the very substance of our soul, satisfying the transient experience of this world in order to gain the paradisal experience of permanent happiness. To attain this station or maqam, we must in turn remember who we are. We must remember that our goal is to become one of the friends of God, whom fear overcometh not, nor are they ever sorrowful. The advice of Islamic spirituality to those who wish to attain permanent happiness is therefore the practice of remembrance of, of, of dhikr. Let us then, throughout the fleeting moments of this life, remember and remember to remember. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Nasser. We have two uh, respondents, as usual. Uh, Vincent Cornell, our first respondent, is Asa Griggs, Candler Professor of Middle East and Islamic Studies here at Emory. His published works include The Way of Abu Madian, 1996, and The Realm of the Saint, Power and Authority in Moroccan Sufism, 1998. His most recent publication is the five-volume book set, Vol Voices of Islam, 2007, a comprehensive introduction to Islamic tradition, thought, and life and civilization with chapters by 50 Muslim authors. Um, since 2002, he's been a participant in the annual Building Bridges seminars of, of Christian and Muslim scholars conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Scott Kugel, our other, have I pronounced your name right? Scott Kugel, our other respondent, is Associate Professor of Middle Eastern and South Asian Studies here at Emory. He received his PhD from Duke University in 2000 in History of Religions and Anthropology. He's the author of six books and numerous articles, including Sufis and Saints' Bodies, Mysticism, Corporeality, and Sacred Power in Islamic Culture, 2007, and Queer Jihad, Struggling to Live as, as Gay, Lesbian, and Transgender Muslims, forthcoming. Before coming to Emory, Dr. Kugel was an assistant professor of religion at Swarthmore College uh, and a research scholar at the Henry Martin Institute for Islamic Studies, Interreligious Dialogue and Conflict Resolution in Hyderabad, India. So first, uh, Vince, if you come up. It's a great honor for me to respond to this eloquent and thought-provoking paper by Dr. Sayed Hussein Nasser, 
I consider Dr. Nasser one of my teachers, although unfortunately I never had the privilege of taking a class from him. Instead, like many others, I learned about him from his books, starting with Sufi essays, which I first read as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco back in the 1970s. Since that time, I have come to know Dr. Nasser personally and consider him a spiritual mentor, a true friend, or in Persian, dost, in the full Sufi sense of the word. Dr. Nasser is one of only two people that I have known that when I first met them, I said to myself, I want to be like that when I grow up. <laughs> Although I am now 59 years old, I still can't say that I am yet a grown-up. Dr. Nasser's description of the effects of modernity on the concept of happiness remind me of the Sufi saying, finding happiness in this world is like finding a rose growing on a garbage heap. It also reminded me of Matthew Arnold's poetic lament in the poem Dover Beach, of the second human fall from Eden engendered by Darwin's origin of species and the theory of evolution, when Arnold said, ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we hear as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. One of the tragedies of our present condition, as Peter Oakes of the University of Virginia has stated, is that we are all born into what he called the original sin of modernity. Dr. Nasser has taught us today that in the Islamic perspective, True happiness is not measured according to worldly delights, but according to the attainment of the spiritual values and insights that are most important and which lead us toward God. In this respect, it is worth pointing out that the Arabic term sa'ada, which as we heard means happiness, also means salvation. As for its opposite, shakawa, the most basic sense of the word does not really mean unhappiness per se, but more importantly means suffering or tribulation. For this reason, shakawa is also used for perdition, recall, recalling both the eschatological notion of hell and the moral psychological notion of hell on earth. This can be seen in the following statement by the 15th century Moroccan Sufi reformer, Muhammad ibn Suleiman al-Jazuli. He said, know that Sa'ada is in God, his saints, and the prophets of God, and that shakawa is in the ego and what arises from it. Here the human self, or nefs, understood in the modern sense of the ego, draws the soul away from God and the teachings of his prophets and saints. This is why it leads to suffering and perdition. Sufi psychology has long been concerned with drawing a clear distinction, as Islam does in general, between the spiritually actualized soul that finds its way back on the straight path, or sirat al-mustaqim, to its origin in God, and the self-indulgent soul, that loses its way in the desert of gross materiality and self-deception. To heal such people, Jazuli prescribed learning from the wisdom of a dog. He said, the dog is not pained, shaki, at the loss of a close relative, nor does he accept assistance from others. Why? Because these are signs that he is secure in his trust for his master. However, despite the fact that we have very good reasons to decry the effects of modernity on our spirituality, we should also not forget that the world has always been seen as an abode of suffering and unhappiness. In addition, if we focus only on ultimate happiness, we may be led to invalidate the more ordinary forms of happiness that are also crucial to the human condition. It is this kind of happiness that Thomas Jefferson referred to when he spoke of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. As Dr. Nasser stated in yesterday's public session, the popular understanding of the pursuit of happiness has today been distorted by the effects of advertising, consumer culture, and hedonistic notions of instant gratification. I remember many years ago seeing a cartoon in Playboy magazine where the pursuit of happiness was depicted as satyrs chasing naked nymphs in a forest. In much of the Muslim world today, this is unfortunately how the pursuit of happiness in the contemporary West is depicted. And it also contributes to the misrepresentation of American social and political values by ideologues of Islamic anti-Westernism. 
Now, we perhaps will never know exactly what Thomas Jefferson meant by the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, but we can be sure that it was not the Playboy philosophy. As I see it, Jefferson most probably meant the pursuit of happiness in the sense that in a just society, people should be free to pursue their own interests and goods according to Protestant notions of conscience and personal calling. In Notes on the State of Virginia in 1781, Jefferson stated that the concept of personal liberty had a theological dimension. Personal liberties are, he said, the gift of God, and quote, they are not to be violated but with God's wrath. Such liberties include the right to pursue one's happiness or satisfaction in a myriad of different ways according to the dictates of reason and with the caution that one's pursuit of happiness does not cause harm to others. Religious conservatives in both Christianity and Islam often forget that granting citizens the legal, the legal right to be wrong is not the same as condoning wrong behavior. According to Jefferson, God's gift of reason is best respected when people are given a chance to make their own, decision, their own decisions. In a letter written in 1794, John Jay, another major figure of the American Revolution, said on this subject, quote, among the strange things of this world, nothing seems more strange than that men pursuing happiness should knowingly quit the right road and take a wrong road, and frequently do what their judgments neither approve nor prefer. Yet so is the fact, and this fact points strongly to the necessity of our, having, of our being healed or restored or regenerated by a power more energetic than any of those which properly belong to the human mind. Although the power that Jay speaks of in this quotation is the god of what he called the Christian dispensation, his words resonate with much of what Dr. Nasser discusses in his paper. Jay also said, to see things as they are, to estimate them aright, and to act accordingly is to be wise. This sentiment is virtually identical to a sentiment expressed by the Muslim philosopher Abu Nasr al-Farabi, whom Dr. Nasser just mentioned, in Tahsil al-Sa'ada, The Attainment of Happiness. This book deserves serious discussion in the present context because it is best described as a handbook for seeing things the way they are. As such, it provides a sort of bridge between the ideas of American founding fathers and Islam. Like many of Farabi's other works, and unlike some of the works of Avicenna, Tahsil al-Sa'ada is both pragmatic and humanistic. In the very first sentence of the book, Farabi states that its subject is, quote, the human things through which nations and members of societies attain earthly happiness in this life and supreme happiness in the life beyond. Thus, it is a book of traditional, meaning non-materialistic humanism, in which earthly happiness falls below ultimate happiness on the scales of values, but it is still valued for its own sake. Although there are certainly significant differences between Farabi's philosophy and that of the Enlightenment founders of the United States of America, both share in acknowledging the validity of worldly happiness, and both stress that the domain of the moral virtues includes political life. To put it another way, although happiness in lesser things may pale before the supreme felicity, it is still worth pursuing for its own self. In the present day US, where Islam is conceived by many as the quintessential other, and where the Sharia is considered the antithesis to the US Constitution, it is important to remind people that some of the most important intellectuals of traditional Islam were hard-headed, practical, and pragmatic people. Farabi was one of these. Although he did not write beautiful spiritual poetry like Avicenna, the entire tradition of Islamic philosophy could not have existed without him. In today's climate of the class of, clash of civilizations, he presents a useful and counterintuitive paradox. This highly respected Islamic philosopher learned his philosophy from Christian monks who kept alive the pagan philosophy of pre-Christian and pre-Islamic Alexandria. Even more, he received his education not in the Middle East, but in Central Asia. Farabi was a Turk from what is now Uzbekistan, and his face appears on what is Kazakhstan's version of the dollar bill. As a final irony, he died on the road to Damascus, although unlike Paul of Tarsus, his encounter was with thieves and not with Christ. Farabi's most important contribution to our discussion of the pursuit of happiness 
is the four questions around which he constructs the argument of his book, Tahsil al-Sa'adah. These questions come from a Greek work, the Isagogi, or Introduction to Aristotle's Categories by the philosopher Porphyry. Despite the fact that they were first posed by Greek pagans, Farabi saw these questions as universal questions that applied to the happiness of all persons, regardless of their religious background. Before determining whether someone, excuse me, before determining whether something makes us truly happy, he said, we should first ask ourselves the following questions. What? What is happiness? How? How is happiness achieved? From what? From what does happiness come? And for what? For what purpose is our happiness intended? Again, let me say them because I think they're important. What is happiness? How is happiness achieved? From what does happiness come? And for what is our happiness intended? Each of these questions can be answered on the theoretical level or even the theological level. However, as Farabi informs us, each of them can also be answered deliberatively, morally, and practically. For most people, the deliberative, moral, and practical aspects of happiness are most important. Tahsil al-Sa'ada, Farabi's book, is best described as an introduction to moral philosophy and a summary description of the hierarchy of virtues from theoretical virtues down through deliberative virtues, moral virtues, and practical virtues. However, if one abstracts the essence of Farabi's logic from his heavy reliance on Aristotle and Plato's political philosophy, one finds within the book an argument not unlike those used by the American founding fathers. Nearly the same questions about happiness and moral virtue have also been asked by American political and moral thinkers from Jefferson through Thoreau to John Dewey. In fact, the only significant difference between Farabi and the philosophically minded founding fathers, such as Jefferson, Jay, or John Adams, is that the latter, the Americans, tended to approach the question of happiness deliberately, deliberatively, morally, and practically, rather than metaphysically, which is what Farabi meant when he uses the term theoretical. Thus, at a time when Islam is seen by many Americans to be quintessentially alien and different from American values, it is important to conclude by asking ourselves two final questions. When we abstract Farabi's four questions from his narrative, when we clear away the debris of time, culture, and epistemology that separate Farabi from our own philosophies, how much difference is really left? Are not these questions as useful for our own time as his? And might they not also help gain a deeper understanding of our own American notion of the pursuit of happiness? Thank you for that summary that took the discussion to a, another plane, Professor Cornell. And thank you to Syed Hussein Nasser also for giving us a wonderful exposition about happiness in the Islamic tradition. And I think the most wonderful aspect of his presentation is its breadth, including visions of happiness in theology and law, philosophy, and Sufism or Islamic mysticism, which are all rooted in the Quran. And there are very few people in North America, I might say very few people anywhere, who had the experience and the erudition to give such an exposition that covers the whole terrain, the whole landscape of Islamic thought with such depth. And so we're very fortunate to have Ustad Nasser with us today. He ended his presentation with the advice to us that we should all engage in zikr, remembrance of God. And that will surely help us all if we think about happiness as we leave here and then promptly forget what we've been thinking about. So my response to Stad Nasser is merely to provide an illustration through stories because we tend to remember stories even as we forget abstract thoughts and ideas. So I wanted to tell a couple of stories that come from a man named Nizamuddin 
Nizamuddin Awliya, who I count as one of my spiritual ancestors and from whom I seek guidance. He was a teacher in the Chishti Sufi order, which helped to spread Islam throughout Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, and that large corner of the world. Before I tell you a little bit about him, uh, let me tell you the story. There was once a Sufi who was traveling, as Sufis do, as we all do, and he fell into a well, a very deep and dark well, which was full of water and had no rope by which he could pull himself out. He was on the brink of destruction and he was in a very sorrowful state. Suddenly, he saw something resembling a rope which was lowered down into the well from above. He recognized it as a way to save himself and very happily he grabbed it and was pulled out of the water. When his vision suddenly cleared from being out in the dark, down in the dark to being out in the light, he found that he was holding the tail of a lion which had lowered its tail down into the well. <laughs> and as he recoiled in terror from the lion, he heard a voice saying, we have saved you from destruction through destruction. We have saved you from destruction through destruction. Now, what does this have to do with happiness? Think about that a little bit. We've heard about happiness lessons from a dog. Now we have happiness lessons from a lion. Nizamuddin Awliya, when he was a young man back in 13th century Delhi, back when Delhi was the capital of the Islamic world, really, one of its shining cities, uh, he was a lot like us here at Emory, or at least many of us, young, intelligent, ambitious, and studying law. He was studying law to qualify as a theologian and a judge in the Islamic tradition, a position that could give him social status, a government salary, guaranteed wealth, and a pious reputation. And he was about 20 years old, and he was convinced that he was on the right path to pursuing happiness, both in this world and the next. But one night, when he was in prayer in a mosque, he heard someone recite from the Quran as it asks, has not the time arrived for believers that their hearts should, in all humility, engage in the remembrance of God? Alam yatni lilladina amanu an takhsha'a kulubuhum lidhikrillahi. He'd read this verse, and so many like it from the Quran since his childhood, but this time it struck him not in his ears or in his mind, but in his heart. And without packing for the journey, he left Delhi with all of its securities, and he'd heard of a Sufi teacher who lived in the remote forests of the Punjab. He took the road out through the countryside to Punjab, which was crawling with lions and robbers and other dangers. He found that Sufi teacher eventually and dedicated his life to him. That Sufi teacher represented a way of being Muslim that was called the Chishti way, the Tariqa Chishtiya. It was founded in India by Muinuddin Chishti, who taught that to worship God as a true Muslim, one should develop generosity like a river, magnanimity like the sun, and hospitality like the earth. Only somebody who does this is being a Muslim. His Sufi teacher told Nizamuddin that to embody these qualities, one had to reject worldly pursuits. So Nizamuddin, being the young law student that he was, offered to give up his studies and abandon his ambition to become a judge. But his, didn't, his teacher did not command him to do this. He said, rejecting the world does not mean leaving the world and sitting idle. No, rejecting the world means wearing clothes and eating food and mixing with people as they are. What comes unasked should be accepted, but not hoarded. One should never let one's heart be attached to anything. Only this is rejecting the world. So Nizamuddin returned to Delhi. He continued his studies, but he slowly realized that he didn't derive the same happiness from his ambition and his goal that he once had. Becoming a scholar or a judge did not hold the same promise of fulfillment that it formerly did. And he gradually realized that giving to others is better than getting for oneself. A government salary and a pious reputation now seemed like a prison of sorrow to Nizamuddin. The path he'd chosen as a way to pursue happiness and fulfillment now seemed like a dead end. 
And in that context, he started to teach about Sufism in Delhi and attract followers from all over India and the wider Islamic world. And to his followers who gathered to hear him, he would tell the story about the Sufi who fell in the well and was rescued by holding on to a lion's tail. We have saved you from destruction through destruction. There's an important practical story, I think, in this on the nature of happiness. The Sufi was happy to find a way out of his sorrow. Happiness and sorrow are these fluctuating opposites that structure our responses to the world. And he grabbed the way of happiness that he felt, but how soon that happiness turned into terror. And this is the way with most of our happinesses, at least in this transitory world. What makes us happy in one moment is the cause for our sorrow in the next. And so we continually are saved from destruction by a new destruction. The thing that we think has saved us will become the thing that will destroy us if we cling to it. Why keep clinging to a lion's tail once you've let it pull you out of the dark well? Hold it for a moment, then let it go and move on as quickly as possible. If happiness isn't something to pursue, we could ask ourselves, is sorrow really something to flee? Nizamuddin Aliya tells another story about happiness, about a Brahmin, that is a, a high class priest, let's say, a high caste priest in the Hindu world in India. A Brahmin who had wealth and status lived in a city. And although the Brahmin was very wealthy, he attracted the envy and the jealousy of others, including the chief magistrate, the Islamic judge of the city in which he lived, who fined him and seized all of his possessions and reduced him to a state of poverty. That Brahmin became absolutely destitute. He was hard pressed to even make ends meet. One day he came across a friend and the friend said, how are you? And he said, well and happy. The friend said, how can you be happy when everything has been taken from you? And the Brahmin replied, still with me is my sacred thread. A, a sacred thread, a very simple thread of white cotton that Brahmins wear over one shoulder and around their waist to symbolize their spiritual station and their attainment of the hope of liberation from this world. That cannot be taken away. The Brahmin in this story is not happy because of events, but in spite of them. He is content. And this is a theme that I wanted to draw out of Dr. Nasser's discussion, that next to happiness and maybe deeper than happiness is something called rida, or contentment. Yesterday, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his guests spoke about happiness as a deep satisfaction or an abiding joy that comes with knowing who you really are. That is like the thread that the Brahmin wears over his shoulder to symbolize his status. That self-knowledge does not fade and it cannot be taken away. That Brahmin was content beyond happiness or unhappiness. And maybe that is a goal that we should embrace for ourselves as we think about happiness, how to attain it, and maybe what its limitations are. Happiness, after all, is a reaction to events or feelings. Contentment, on the other hand, is restraint in the face of events or feelings. Wonderful things or terrible things are just things. We make them wonderful or terrible by our usually short-sighted assessment of what they are. Again, the Sufi floundering in the well is extremely happy to hold on to a lion's tail until he realizes what he's holding on to. Contentment gives one the inner strength and endurance in ways that mere happiness does not. Nizamuddin Aulia used to teach his followers that patience is that when something terrible happens to you, you bear with it and you do not complain. But contentment is when something terrible happens to you, you do not regard it as terrible, but instead you act as if that misfortune has never been befallen you. Many times it happens that a traveler will have a thorn lodge in his foot his foot may even begin to bleed, but the traveler is hurrying along so fast and is so preoccupied with the journey and reaching his destination that he doesn't take any notice of the pain that has happened in his foot. Only later does he become aware of the pain. Now, if you reflect on the lesson of these incidents, says Nizam al-Din, in which pain goes unnoticed, you'll understand how much more the same reflex characterizes the one who is preoccupied with meditating 
on God and remembering God, doing zikr. That is the very same attitude described by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in his talk yesterday. He told us that when something bad happens that causes him pain or suffering or sorrow, he tries to look at it from a distance or from a different angle or from within in order to discover what it is inside that event that has a potential for goodness, that has a potential for causing happiness. So I wanted to just offer to you this idea that maybe the pursuit of happiness isn't such a good goal for us. I think Nizamuddin Aulia in 13th century Delhi would say that pursuing happiness may be good in the short term, but pursuing contentment would be a much better goal for the long term because contentment is deeper than happiness or unhappiness. It's deeper than hope or fear. These fluctuating states that structure our life uh, are fleeting. One leads to the other as long as we remain attached to the things in this world in a selfish way. So perhaps the pursuit of contentment might be something that we want to think about. I think that that flows uh, rather nicely from Professor Nasser's talk that he gave us today. And it certainly is, as he mentioned, contentment is the highest goal of most Sufi thinkers. They put it above happiness and sometimes even above love or hope. So contentment might be another aspect of happiness that we could think about through these stories, and I thank you for giving me the chance to respond to your talk. Thank you. Uh, we have, I suppose, three or four minutes for questions and observations. There are microphones uh, set up in the room. I hope they're switched on. So I would welcome any questions or observations from anybody in the audience. Can somebody help with that? I think, hello? Yeah, that's, okay. that's good, you go okay. ahead. Um, I'm content with both your, all your talks, um, but since Zikr was mentioned, I don't know if, if any of you would feel comfortable in giving us a taste of that, of, of a few minutes of Zikr um, for folks who would like to join in in, in that. She wants a if performance if of Zika. She wants a performance? Would you lead a few minutes of Zika? No. Uh, well, if any of you speak first, we care. The levels of the performance of Zik, uh the recession of the Quran, of course, is itself a form of Zik, and one of the names of the Quran is Zikrullah. But the technical performance of the Zek uh, by the Fuqara, by those who initiated among Sufis, I do not believe that they should just be performed anywhere in public. They need certain preparation, and I'm not one of those who's willing to perform them in public, I'm sorry to say. Professor Nasser, I had a question. Um, you spoke a little bit about divine law and the Sharia. And my question is, what happens when other human beings begin to regulate the observance of this divine law? Does it then lead to happiness or does it lead to discontentment and sometimes even war? And how would we balance the role of the divine and the role of politics and social structures? Uh, conflict and war, unfortunately, are part and parcel of human existence. Every time we have a vaccination against the flu, we're carrying out war against those particular life forms which cause the flu. There's no doubt about that. And uh, the question is what kind of conflict, what kind of war? Uh, of course, Societies that do not believe in the Sharia also fight wars all the time. I don't have to say that in uh, Georgia, uh, obviously. 
uh, all different kinds of societies, all different kinds of civilizations. The difference between following the Sharia and not following the Sharia uh, is that, first of all, the Sharia does not lead to conflict and war. It leads to the assertion of the preservation of Islam, of, your, of one's religion, and of one's home, and one's family, and one's life, all of these things are in the Sharia. And if one has to fight for these things, for self-preservation, uh, so be it. It's not the cause of, uh, of unhappiness. Of course, all conflict has unhappiness in it. But uh, all of the soldiers who in this country have fought in various wars for, to preserve the interests of the United States, many of them have suffered, many of them have been killed. Yes, of course. But they all had the idea that they were fighting for a cause, and therefore the fighting for that cause permitted them to, to carry out these acts. Uh, you must not confuse a law which seeks to govern human existence with all of its ups and downs, our frailties, and the possibility of conflict which is innate to the human state and to living on this earth with a kind of passivism. Uh, what the Sharia does is to limit conflict to the extent that is possible. And to, uh, therefore, to even you have to participate in it you feel as if you are doing the least immoral. To be completely moral in a particular sense is to be a Quaker. Uh, the only Christians you could say are the Quakers because they are pacifists. But there are many other very good Christians who are not Quakers. And uh, they, do not, they feel that they're also living their religion even if they have to fight for one cause or another which they feel to be just according to justice or preservation of themselves or their nation or whatever, whatever it is that is going on. So this is a question somewhat simplistic. And uh, in order to fully answer that, we have to understand the larger context. Uh, the idea that is behind this question is that uh, religions cause war. If no one doesn't follow religion, one can be very peaceful and moral atheists. This is one of the positions of the 20th century. Forgetting that uh, the 20th century caused more death through wars than all the centuries of human existence combined together. And that not a single one of these was, caught, was fought for the cause of religion. When over a million Frenchmen and Germans killed each other in the First World War, just a few yards apart, or uh, in Russia, some 20 million people died. In Germany, 11 million people died in the Second World War. And these are figures which are just astounding. None of these were wars of religion. And so behind this question uh, stands a, f a very fallacious p position of many people in the modern world who want to prove to God that they can be good without God. And so, so very uh, secretly in their soul, they try very hard to prove that they're very moral and upright beings while they're opposed to religion. But unfortunately, experience has proved otherwise. Human beings, whether they follow a religion or they do not follow a religion, oftentimes fight wars and they kill each other. And there's no war in the Middle Ages only fought by Islam according to the Sharia that causes the same devastation that countries without any religious law causes the Second World War to each other, even taking the difference in technologies into consideration. I think we have time for one more question, but our time is up, I don't know. No, I, um, our time is up. I've been instructed to keep the trains running strictly on schedule, so I do apologize to those of you. And that, uh, thank you again, Professor Nasser and Vincent Scott. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.